you were one of the most intriguing characters of our generation, I think. You, uh, you cracked the code on the human genome, and for most people that would be sufficient for a life's work. Uh, but but uh, you're, you're going now after uh, uh, trying to find the replacements for everything we've been talking about this morning, oil, gas, coal. How close are you getting to the answer? Well, it's, it's not totally clear yet. Uh, we're at the early stages of seeing what biology can do in ways that people hadn't imagined. I think biology has the chance to be the true definition of a disruptive technology because of the exponential growth of biological systems, producing huge amounts of substances from them is theoretically very possible. Uh, so the program we have with ExxonMobil to try and go from carbon dioxide and sunlight to hydrocarbons that could go right into the refineries, we're at a relatively early stage. Uh, my team uh, at Synthetic Genomics had a major breakthrough in changing the genetic code of some algae, uh, because algae was viewed as a farming problem for people. You grow up algae, you harvest it, you extract the hydrocarbons. We engineered the algae so they would just continuously pump out the hydrocarbons into the media in a pure form. Uh, so theoretically, that makes it really nice. You just continually harvest this. Uh, the question you and I were talking about before is scale. Well, and that's, that's right. the real bugaboo here for everybody. Right. So bugaboo is the uh, is a good word for what you're doing. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're you're looking at a whole portfolio of biological projects. Uh, what are the one or two that you think are most promising? Is it the the, the one that you're working on with Exxon? Is it uh, something else? I, I think the most promising is the fundamental technology that we've been developing at the Venter Institute with funding from Synthetic Genomics, and we're very close to the first cell powered by a completely synthetic uh, DNA genome, which means what we've been switching to do over the last couple of decades is going from when we read the human genome, we go from the four-letter code of uh, genetics, ACs, Gs, and Ts, into the two-digit uh, form in the computers. And now we're taking that digital code and we're writing new software. Uh, so we can actually design in the computer cells to do what we want them to do. And so the areas we're applying these, obviously, uh, the, uh, the approach with Exxon, with uh, CO2 uh, to uh, BioCrude, uh, with BP... And what that means yeah. is that you create a bug that, uh, that its feedstock, its food, is actually CO2. So it consumes CO2, helps the environment in that way, and then creates fuel. That's right. So. Uh, we're using natural organisms and modifying them right now. Uh, but exactly what you said, the carbon that ends up in the carbon-based fuels, that carbon came from CO2. Uh, so these organisms use sunlight, they fix the CO2 into these hydrocarbon molecules, that the goal with this program is to go right into uh, the Exxon refineries and create gasoline, diesel, maybe Jet A, that's indistinguishable, basically, from what we use today. And, and that's going to be a challenge, because the regulatory system thinks of biofuels as separate. If we actually have regular gasoline, uh, diesel coming out of refineries, all based on CO2, uh, it, it's going to confuse the system. What's the time horizon for their, their investment? When do they expect you to, to actually be able to deliver fuel? So it's a staged process, as, as we're talking. Scalability is the biggest issue. Uh, there's over 200 algae companies, I think, in the U.S. alone. If we can't generate billions of gallons of fuel uh, per year per facility, uh, it's not going to work. It's just people playing and wasting investors' money. But uh, I think with the Exxon engineering team and their money, we have a chance to scale it up. We're going through a series of stages. Uh, I think it's at least, though, our optimistic view is on the order of a decade before you would have uh, gasoline in your tank made from carbon dioxide. Uh, but within a decade, or a, a roughly a decade. Roughly a decade is our optimistic view. And ultimately, on the scalability question, ultimately how, how far can you scale this? I mean, what kinds of, if, if you look at the transportation problem that we were talking about, a couple billion cars mm -hmm. on the road, what kind of, uh, uh, how long will it take to get to a point where a significant portion of those could be powered by fuel that's produced uh, through these algae that you uh, create? Well, let me give you a couple of comparisons. People are used to now uh, uh, ethanol made from corn, at least in this country. Uh, 
to replace the transportation fuels, it would take a facility three times the size of the U.S. to do it on corn. If we do it from algae, even with our reasonable predictions now, it takes a facility roughly the twice the size of the state of Maryland. It's still a huge facility, but that's You're replacing about the basic, the grow, growing the, 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 the basic uh, facilities for producing the hydrocarbons to go into existing refineries. The scale is still large. We're talking about facilities the size of San Francisco, but it's doable. But it's doable. If you had to predict, I mean, you look 20 years, 30 years down the road, uh, how much of the how much of our fuel could come from uh, will come from this sort of algae. Theoretically, all transportation fuels could be replaced by this. There's no shortage of the kind of facilities we need in terms of uh, areas with lots of sunlight and seawater. Uh, look at the deserts around the world uh, near uh, oceans. Uh, so there's no land shortage, there's no water shortage associated with this. It really is going to get down to the cost equation. Uh, is the cost of these facilities too expensive versus the costs and the price of the fuel. And it's too early to know. So you're looking at two, as, in terms of the fundamental biology, you're doing two things. One is you're working on synthetic biology, right. creating life that can uh, serve this purpose. And the other thing you do, if I understand it right, is sail around the world in your sailboat and look for uh, uh, genes that have already been created in uh, biodiverse places around the world. That, that's a pretty good gig. It, it's uh, why I have a lot of fun with my job. Uh, <laughs> so. How much time do you spend on the boat in, in, a, in a year? Well, unfortunately, not, not enough. Uh, and the idea started after we uh, finished the human genome in 2000, looking what we could apply these tools to. And uh, we knew virtually nothing about the environment. And so we decided just to do a shotgun sequence into the ocean and discovered in just a barrel of seawater 40,000 new species and a million new genes. Uh, and so we've been sampling around the world. We're, we've published over 20 million genes to date. We're about to double that number again. And the importance of this is when you're writing the genetic code out of the computer, I view these genes as our uh, our raw materials, our tools, the same way the electronics industry had resistors and capacitors and transistors and eventually integrated circuits. We have all these design components that we're discovering uh, in organisms around the planet uh, that probably for the first stages of uh, an exon or other facilities will be either natural occurring organisms or ones that have been had simple modifications. But imagine if we have dozens of these multi-billion dollar facilities and we can design a new algae from scratch that has two or three times the efficiency of anything that occurs naturally, that will be a game changer overnight, uh, doubling or tripling the capacity of any facility. So you're, when you're out on your boat, you're not just looking for uh, new forms of algae that might serve your purposes. You're looking for the genetic information that you can use in your synthetic yeah. biology products. In fact, we don't capture any cells. We're just capturing all the DNA that we find in the ocean. We decode it, uh, build up these huge computer databases so that when we want genes that do different purposes, we just pull these out of the computer. And the notion now that we can write the genetic code. DNA is, in fact, the software of life. So we can go from computer software to life software and design new systems to do things that uh, have never happened before. 